before we kind of hop in um, to what I'm talking about. Hey, Joanne, how are you? Okay, so we're um, gonna say a quick prayer and then we will hop into tonight's lesson. Dear Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I come before you on behalf of everyone who is watching this either live or the replay. Please let your words enter into our hearts so that we, we may receive what you were trying to tell us so that we may understand what you were seeking from us in this moment, in this time that we're all going through together. I know that we have all kind of been a little uneasy and on edge with everything that's happened over the past year, but through you and through a fellowship with you, you will bring a level of calmness. You will bring a level of understanding and clarity that we're all seeking. And I pray that each person who is listening to this message that you want me to share will receive that message and then they will seek to be in fellowship with you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, so tonight our topic is fellowship activated. And we are reading from Romans 6, 10 through 11 in the Amplified Version. For the death that he died, he died to sin, ending his power and paying the sinner's debt. Once and for all, and the life that he lives, he lives to glorify God and unbroken fellowship with him. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but alive to God and unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Oh, my aunt's on. Hi, Ann. <laughs> okay, so that is the that is the scripture. The two scriptures we're going to go over um, tonight, where we're going to talk about on this Good Friday, we're going to walk through the event that allowed us to have fellowship to be activated with God. Now, most times when we're talking about Good Friday, we're talking about the crucifixion, we're talking about the resurrection and the ascension. But this Good Friday, I want to talk about one thing that usually doesn't get enough attention in regards to what happens after Jesus' resurrection. And that is we have a covenant relation with God that becomes activated due to that resurrection. And so because of that resurrection, we now have a direct line to God. In the Old Testament, they would have to go to the priest and the priest would go and talk to God on their behalf and come back and relay the message. Because of the resurrection, we no longer have to go to a priest to tell them um, what we're doing, what's going on, how we feel. We have a direct relationship to God. Now, you probably know that but the term of that direct relationship is fellowship. It's not eating in the fellowship hall. It's not just breaking bread. Um, a lot of people think of Acts 2.42, where it's talking about breaking bread. But the last part of that scripture is actually and to pray. So we're going to talk about what happens when fellowship is activated due to the resurrection. So when Jesus was crucified, he died both a natural and a spiritual death, but he didn't die alone. Our old selves died too. Everything we thought we were, wanted to be, do, seen as, died as well. The moment we chose God was the moment our lives began anew. Our new lives now have a different meaning. It's to glorify God. That's through our actions, thoughts, behavior and what we're called to do. This transformation happens through fellowship. Fellowship is the basis for salvation. As the covenant where we have an intimate relationship with God. This is where we become vulnerable, open, transparent, honest, and let God enter our hearts and soul to breathe life into us as we, as we go throughout our days. This new covenant releases us from having to try to earn God's favor. Grace is unconditionally 
accepting his favor as a free gift. It's something we don't have to work for. It's something we don't have to do. It is there. We receive it. Um, all we have to do is receive it. We don't have to do any good works um, to receive the gift. It is a gift. And so God gives it to us freely. Our sins have been forgiven and eternal life is secure. God eagerly desires to fill our lives with blessings and protection from spiritual wickedness. So when the resurrection happened, we were the ones who actually gained a lot from um, the sacrifice that Jesus made. God gave us salvation, eternal life, grace, mercy. He's protecting us from outside forces that are trying to cause us harm or attack us. And he answers our prayers. We receive all of that. And we did not have to actually do the sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. And then we received all of these things because of that. When Jesus was crucified, the power that sin had over, over us died too. When we choose sin, we collect the wages that go with it, such as weakness, sickness, and the loss of spiritual fellowship with God. See John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, which is actually our foundational scriptures for Soul Simulator Sanctuary. Um, and you'll learn more about that in another video. What we once thought was everything we could have ever imagined we wanted no longer leaves a satisfying taste in our mouth. So before we could be in sin, before before the crucifixion, we could be in sin. We were happy that we were in sin. We didn't know any better. But once we chose to accept Christ because of his sacrifice, we now know better. We now know what we wanted is not actually what we want or what we need. We know what we were doing before is not actually things that we should should be doing now that we know better. Now we may wrestle with some of the things we enjoyed in the past, some of the things that we liked to do in the past, some of the people we used to hang out with in the past. We will wrestle with that because we're human and Humans like to be comfortable. We like to, we're creatures of habit. And so if that's something you were used to or you enjoyed or you like, you will wrestle with it if it's not aligned with um, scripture, if it's not aligned with the word of God. But once you're in true fellowship with God, you'll feel unfulfilled by anything that is not called according to his purpose, which is Romans 8, 28. So once you are truly in fellowship, you'll begin to understand what needs to fall off, what you need to let go of, what you need to release. Because at the end of the day, you won't have that same satisfaction doing it now that you have a different relationship with God. Now that you are in alignment with God, now that you are in tune with him, you'll be able to hear um, his voice when he speaks to you, how he speaks to you, because he speaks to speaks to us in different ways. So when you hear from him, you'll understand mm, that's not a, you know, what I want to do, or that's not the direction I need to go in at this moment. Sometimes you may have to just scrap every single thing that you thought, every single thing that you were doing before and <laughs> start all over. Like I did when I was working on this. <laughs> okay. So entering into true fellowship fills your soul with an indescribable feeling. Fellowshipping with God takes place in a spiritual realm. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are now baptized in the spirit. And through the spirit, we are related to the father. So this is something I learned. The word baptism, when you translate it from Greek, was used for dyeing clothes. You would dip a cloth in dye, you let it soak or be baptized so that it would absorb the color. The properties of the dye become visibly part of the cloth. The dye transform the cloth. So when we are dipped in the blood of Jesus, we take on the properties of Jesus. They become part of us. We are now transformed into our new self. That's Galatians 2.20. So essentially what it's saying is when Jesus died on that cross and we died to our old selves, we became new. 
we are now taking on the properties, the characteristics, the behavior of Jesus when he walked on this earth. That is what we're supposed to do. Now, do we do it every day? No. Do I do it every day? No. But that is something we strive to do on a daily basis. Okay. So with this fellowship, we receive, uh, with this relationship, we receive the gift of fellowship with God and other believers. And all we're expected to give in return is obedience. But we do have to understand that biblical freedom has healthy limits. So even though God gives us free will, does not mean that it does not come with consequences. There's a boundary in which we are to behave and think and do and act and whatever it is we're doing. So we have to make sure that whatever it is we're doing, we're not stepping outside of those boundaries, just like you would in any situation that you're in, any relationship, any job, you know what it is you're allowed to do and what it is you're not allowed to do. You also know if you do something you're not allowed to do, you're going to have consequences. So if we step outside of those boundaries, if we step outside of obedience, then we're going to have consequences. And that's something that we normally don't think of when we're at, um, doing something we shouldn't be doing. Usually we see that as God is punishing us. God is attacking us when it's just the consequence of the choice that we made. So it's not always God coming at you to try to get you back in alignment. Sometimes it's just you made a choice and that choice had consequences and it needs to play out. Fellowship is such a critical piece of the church, one that is often not given the same attention as other aspects. Too many believers don't experience close fellowship with God. As a result of this distance, you don't get to see God work on your behalf in a dramatic way. So you can look at Psalms 18, 16 through 19. When you're in true fellowship with God and you're going through something, he knows you're going through it. And if you're in true fellowship, you'll be able to see everything play out and it will completely blow your mind. I saw God move in a dramatic way for me last year. Um, I share, I haven't shared the details, but let's just say that it really was something that I was pleasantly surprised that he did because it has, it had been something that I had been praying for, for a few years. Um, I was obedient. I was consistent with fasting, with reading the Bible, with praying. I, was in communion with him every single day. I was speaking to God every day. I was listening to him every day. I was repenting, seeking forgiveness. I was doing what I needed to do to remove obstacles and distractions outside of me so that I had given my full attention to God. And in that, and in doing that, he blessed me in a way that I never thought um would happen because I just, I'm, I'm still at that time, I was still learning how to trust. And so he, he showed me that all I had to do was just release and let it go, just trust him and it would happen. And that was only that, that trust only built because I spent, spent daily time with God. I was um, able to really understand where our relationship was last year. And, you know, today, it, of course, it has improved, but that would not have happened if I wasn't in daily communion. And even though churches tell you to pray, they don't go into a little bit more detail to explain to you what that means. When you're in communion with God, when you're in fellowship with God, yes, you're praying, but you're doing a lot more to make sure that you are giving your full attention to God during the time that you have set aside to spend with him, whether it's praying, fasting, reading the Bible, uh, listening to praise and worship music, whatever the case may be, you have to give your full attention so that you can hear um, when God is speaking back to you during that time. Fellowship creates a sense of belonging. 
a sense of kinship with God and fellow believers. Think of a family reunion. If you haven't seen your family in a long time or you're just meeting them for the first time, you're probably a little hesitant. As you begin to hear stories from the rest of the relatives and they tell you that you remind them of great aunt so-and-so or uncle so-and-so, you relax a little bit. The same with fellowship with God and other believers. The more time you spend with God, the more you begin to trust that we, he will keep his promises and his word will come through for you. I saw it firsthand last year. As with other believers, the more time you spend getting to know them on a heart level, the more aligned you'll become to the point that they will show up for you before you even have to ask. They will be ready to roll if you need someone to come through for you. So if you're in a small group and you're meeting just once um, a week for an hour or an hour and a half and you don't get to know people outside of that time, you're not in fellowship with them. You're in community because you're in a small group, but you're not in fellowship. You're not getting to know them on an intimate level. And intimacy is not a romantic feeling. Intimacy is where you are transparent and open and honest with people to the point where they actually feel that they know you on a soul level. Just like you're open and honest and vulnerable and transparent with God when you're praying or you're in your quiet time, you also have to have that same um emotions, set of emotions when you're with other believers. That is how you create true fellowship with other believers. That is how you start to build your spiritual family here on earth. Jesus' resurrection not only gave us salvation, but it created a new covenant with God. And through this fellowship, God allows us to create a special relationship with other believers as we are all now part of the same kinship. Like I said, when you open up that set of emotions and you allow people in and you share, they share, and you have an understanding and a trust that you're not going to share that with other people, you begin to grow a, a special kinship with them. You may not be blood related to them, but you are now spiritually related to them. And just like with your family, you're going to be there for them Um if something, if they are in need of something. When I led the young adult ministry, when I was in college, we had no budget. In fact, the ministry was on life support. Um, I was told as long as I didn't spend money and what I came up with wasn't too out of the box, we could possibly do it. Well, the first lady let me work. She let me get creative and use my imagination I mean, we even had like the army fatigue shirts with the block lettering in yellow. This is way before people were doing it now. Um, <laughs> and then she eventually gave me a budget. And this is where fellowship truly transformed the young adult ministry at that church through intentional activity. Sunday school classes. We had retreats. We went out to eat at least twice a month together. And we had um, we went bowling. We, we did a lot of things. This helped create a bond for people who were away from home. The young adult ministry were college age and like young married couples. So a lot of them were either here at school away from their family or they moved here as a young married couple um, to a new city for a job. So they didn't really know a lot of people. We had to create that feeling in that ministry so that when they came, they felt that they belonged. They felt welcome. They immediately knew that people were going to be there for them. Because of that feeling that we created through the fellowship, we increased Sunday school and Bible study attendance. Uh, people didn't just come for the fun stuff. They also began to come to Sunday school and we ended up with two classes, one in the first uh, block and the second block. It was a, it was a pretty big church. So there were two Sunday school hours. Even though I left that church, the feeling of belonging has not been felt with any other Christian community I have had uh, or I've been a part of since. I make myself comfortable 
because I'm comfortable with myself, but having a sense of belonging when you're part of a Christian community is something that you shouldn't force yourself to feel. It should just happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you're probably not in the right space for you or they haven't created the atmosphere for fellowship to take place. So you have to evaluate, do you feel that you truly belong there or are you just telling yourself that you're comfortable in this space? Um, Because you can make yourself comfortable, but after a while friction will rear its head and you'll start to see that that may not be the place for you or you were placed there And you are the one who is supposed to create that fellowship feeling with the other believers at the church. So, you know, if that's the case, pray about that. Knowing God carefully planned out something that would mean he would sacrifice his only son, not just for our salvation, but to give us a new relationship with him shouldn't be taken for granted. Being able to tap into the greatest source There is to receive grace, mercy, answer prayers, spiritual gifts, promises, and so much more. And all he asks for in return is obedience. Just makes you realize how truly special the bond is. We are the ones who are are receiving the bulk of everything, the, the benefits, the bulk of the benefits. God only is asking for our obedience. And through our obedience, is how we glorify him, how his presence is felt here on earth. In Mark chapter one, verse 35, Jesus went into the wilderness to have uninterrupted time in prayer with God, away from distraction. Jesus used this time to fellowship with God. If Jesus considered this a priority and then was crucified and resurrected, so we too could have this fellowship with God, Why do so many believers consider fellowship an afterthought? Fellowship is more than breaking bread. It's a covenant that you must put effort into just like any other relationship. Through prayer, reading the Bible, fasting, repenting, because we all need to change our minds about sin. (laughs) Uh, Especially because there's something we all have to let go of seeking forgiveness, praising and worshiping through music, we grow deeper with God and other believers. That time we spend with him only strengthens that covenant. Jesus was crucified so the power of sin would no longer have a hold over us, thus ushering in a new relationship with God and other believers through his resurrection. What are you doing with those relationships? So, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this word. I pray that everyone who listened to this word, who received this word, will begin to truly seek a fellowship with you, and they will truly find the space where they can fellowship with other believers. Let them take these words and place it in their heart. Let them meditate on these words. I pray that these words give them strength and give them confidence and give them encouragement to find that Christian community that they can belong to so that they are in fellowship with other believers and they begin to grow a deeper fellowship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So that is just the word that I wanted to share. Um, I, I'm not pretty sure anything. So yeah, there was no hooping or hollering. 